All right, let's talk parenting. Ephesians 6, verse 4. Ephesians 6, verse 4, fathers do not exasperate, meaning don't frustrate your children. Instead, bring them up, raise them, parent them, and train them and instruct them in the Lord. So there's a charge of what parenting is all about. It also says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up our children in the way they should go. That's what we're called to do. Train them up in the way they should go. In what way should they go? The right way, right? The godly way, the, the chase after Jesus kind of way toward eternity with Jesus, right? Not eternity in the pit of hell. That's our desire, that's our, and that's a charge, though. And so we look at that, and in and and the same time it says in Psalm 127 that children are a blessing and a reward from God. And we're to train them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, to do it the right way, not abusively, but in an encouraging way so that they will know Jesus and they'll walk with him. So how does this happen? What does this look like? Seems impossible. I mean, seriously, there were days, there were weeks, there were months, maybe years. I won't talk any more stories about Jake or anything now, but he did leave the room, so I guess I could. But, you know, there, there are times when it's just hard, and you wonder how in the world are we going to be successful at this? And that's when you got to trust the Lord because it isn't up to you. you got to remember that it is he who gives us everything we need for parenting and godliness. It's God. It's not all on your shoulders. And that's something I want to make sure you hear right up front. That the success of your children, it's not all on your shoulders. You have a very significant role and actual charge from God in raising them. I love the scripture that says, as much as it's possible with you, be at peace with all men, right? I look at that with parenting too. As much as it's possible with us, we raise our kids. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about, as much as it's possible with us. I was just reading in Ezekiel, actually in the prayer room this morning, and in Ezekiel 18, near the end of the chapter, it talks about, actually throughout the chapter of Ezekiel 18, it talks about how the, the father who sins is going to reap the consequences of those sins, not the son. Now, if the son sins, he's going to reap the consequences of sin. But if the father sins and the son doesn't sin, the son isn't going to pay the price for the father's sins. Conversely, the other way around. If the father is loving Jesus and, and, and living righteously and repentant and humble before the Lord, and as much as it's possible with him, he's at peace with all men and he's raising his children in the way they should go. Yet the son runs off the wrong direction. The son's responsible for his actions at that point. The father, he's all good. That's what it says in Ezekiel 18. Read it. It could be some encouragement. I didn't even plan on talking about that today, but boy, does that ever apply as we look at parenting. It really does. So we're going to approach parenting from that perspective that it's all, we, we need Jesus, we need his grace, his power, that's what his grace is, and he's given it to us. Um, I want to present three biblical principles, three biblical parenting principles. Say that three or four times fast. Three biblical parenting principles. Come on. No, do it. Seriously, do it. All right, see? See, it's not so easy, is it? It's not so easy getting up here and talking. Number one, principle number one, it's the mini-me principle is what I call it. This is the mini-me. Come on, Mario. It's biblical. You're going to see what I do with this now, ready? Right? It's the mini-me principle of parenting. And that is this. Our children are watching, and they're going to be more like us than, than we even realize. Our, our children are watching, and they're going to be more like us then maybe we want sometimes. But ultimately, we need to be those people who can say, yeah, I want my kids to be like me. Because there is a mini-me principle that's out there that you're not going to avoid. Your kids 
are going to be a lot like you. They're going to love what you love. They're going to hate what you hate. I'm not talking across the board. It's a little bit of a generalization, but the principle stands true. There's a mini-me principle. It says this in John chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. He said, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. We were made in the image of God, weren't we? I mean, we can look at how the Father and the Son, the Godhead, work together and the Holy Spirit. We can see how the Trinity works together, and we're made in the image of God. The relationship between the Father and Son carries to us because we're made in His image. And the Son is saying, I can only do, I'm going to do what I see the Father doing because I'm the Son, and He's my Father. And so I'm watching Him, I'm listening to Him, I'm going to say what He tells me to say, and I'm going to be like Him. If you see me, you've seen the Father, he says. Right? I mean, this is the mini-me principle. And I feel okay calling it a mini-me principle, even though it's about Jesus and the Father. The Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. So parents, we love our children, and so we show them all that we do. Whether you want to show them or not, I'm here to tell you, you're showing them all that you do. They're watching. They're mini-me's. Have you seen my son, Ben? He's a mini-me. He looks just like me, first of all. He's going to be big like me. My other boy stopped at like 6'1 or so. But that, that Ben, he's going to be, he's like a little mini-me. And all my kids, I'm telling you what, they watch us. I'll tell you some stories about that. So again, the relationship between Jesus and the Heavenly Father, perfect, perfect model of what God has designed for the parent-child relationship. And we're going to have the predisposition of our moms and our dads. We're going to, be, we're going to mimic, we're going to copy, we're going to follow them. Again, it's, it's demonstrated by Jesus. It says in Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance. That means the reflection. The Greek word means the reflection, the radiance, the reflection, the glow of who? God's glory, that's the Father. The Son is the reflection of the Father, of the glory of the Father in the exact representation of His being. Jesus, the Son, reflects the Father. That's just how God is, and it's how He created us in His image. And the family relationship and dynamic, our children are a reflection of us. So if your children are driving you crazy, just think about how many people you must be driving crazy? You know, I'm serious. All right. Our children are going to reflect us. They're going to represent who we are. They're going to become mini-me's. I'm a lot like that with my dad. I picked up the good, the bad, and the ugly of my dad. I just did. I mean, I picked up things like, man, I learned how to fix things because I watched my dad. I learned how to manage money because my dad is an incredible steward of finances. And I watched him, and I picked up on those things. My dad also, when I was growing up, he had an anger issue. And he would throw keys. He, he popped a hole in the wall. I mean, he had some, he's, okay, dad, if, you, if you're listening to this at some time, you're 95% past all that. So praise God for that. But I caught it. I became a reflection, a radiance of those good qualities and those bad qualities. I picked it up. I became a mini-me of my dad. So I'm I'm pretty good steward with finances like my dad. I've learned how to do that. I was brought up that way. I watched it happen. I can fix things. I can, I can just dive in and, and, and not call the handyman. I'm going to go for it myself. And I got tools, you know, because my dad had tools, and so I got to have tools, right? I remember when I was a kid, and we had mopeds, and we weren't, I was too young to drive them on the street, so I would race them around my house. We lived in the Midwest in Illinois. I'd race them around my house, these, these mopeds. I thought it was fast. It was like 30 miles an hour. I was just probably 12 years old. Well, one day, I'm racing around, and most of it is on the, on the grass. Well, it just had rained, which it does a lot in the Midwest. It just had rained. So I take this corner, 
and I just slide. I mean, I don't turn. I just keep sliding. I go right into our rock wall. We had a rock wall on three corners of our property. And I slammed into the rock wall. The, the, uh, the wheel hits, bends the two front forks, just like that. I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm a dead man. Because remember, my dad had the anger issue, you know what I'm saying? And he paid. He's the one who bought these things, right? And we weren't supposed to be racing them around. We just kind of did it. And so what did I do? I took what I learned from my dad. I did what he would do. I got out two two-by-fours. I got out a hammer. I put those, those front forks in between the two-by-four, and I started hammering, gently hammering those things back till they were straight. And I kept working it, and I put those things back on, and it worked. It worked. It, it was amazing. So I picked up, but I also picked up anger. And Jake can testify to that. Then the one who's come along later, he didn't have to deal with as much as that. Praise God for sanctification, right? And freedom and deliverance and breaking chains and, and things like that, right? We can, we, can, we can cut things off. We can walk in the new. Even if it's something we've picked up in the past, we can, we can walk as new creations in Christ Jesus. Our past doesn't have to define us, and the things we picked up don't have to define us. But we still do pick things up, and we still do deposit things in our kids. So I had to deal with that because I picked it up because of the mini-me principle. I caught that. Sometimes people will talk about generational blessings and curses. I tend to think it's this mini-me principle that is most of what we're talking about with blessings and curses that are generational that we're passing down. We're passing down habits, ways of thinking, ways of acting, ways of approaching life, ways of managing things, ways of treating other people. We're passing things down because the kids are watching and they're picking it up. Just like the son picked up what the father and who the father was and became an exact reflection, radiance of him. So that's the mini-me principle and it should put a little bit of pressure on us, and that's not a bad thing. You know, we always act better when we know somebody's watching us. I don't know about you, but, but I don't pick my nose as much when I'm driving around now. I'm just, I don't know why I'm going there. Every time I teach in here and I'm not preaching, I always go to crazy, weird places. Uh, wasn't in my notes. But seriously, I don't pick my nose as much driving down the road anymore. Not like I did it too much, Tim. It wasn't like a major habit or anything. But I don't do it so much because there's cameras everywhere. I mean, every corner, there's cameras catching every direction. I've been over in the Gilbert uh, Police Department where they monitor literally every intersection in Gilbert. You want to know the one that's monitored the most? Gilbert and Guadalupe. I'm not kidding you. They've got every camera from every angle. They will tell you, you know, they might even be able to tell you the color of your underwear. I don't know, man. They got all kinds of cameras there, infrared. I don't know what they have. But I'm sitting there in that command control center. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm going to behave when I'm driving around this town, man, because they are watching. They're watching. That's just extra credit right there. Some little extra information. They're watching. You know what I'm saying? So our kids are watching. They're going to pick it up. They're going to pick it up. That's the mini-me principle. So if we're aware of that, that biblical principle, we're creating the image of God, that, that, that father-son relationship, that parent-child relationship, if we're aware of that, then it's going to change the way we approach parenting and our role as parents. We're going to know now it's obviously not like our parents used to say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. As I do. That's, that's the craziest, most backward, unbiblical, unreal statement ever made about parenting. We're going to do what our parents did. We're going, to, we're going to watch them, and we're going to start walking that way, talking that way. It's just the way it's going to be. And so if we know that as parents, man, we're equipped. we got some knowledge and understanding of how this was all created and designed, and we can maybe pay a little bit more attention when we're driving down the road, so to say, so to speak, right? All right. That's the first principle. Any questions about that? Any, any ideas, any thoughts? Lori. It's sin, yeah. I'm a sinner.
It's And that's a good approach. I'm going to talk about that later, about how we need to be honest and open um, and include our children in on, the, on what we're dealing with and what we're processing in life. I'll talk about that in just a, in just a little bit. Amen. Amen. to be the standard. Jesus is the role model, not the opposite of a bad role model maybe that you had growing up. Yeah, and we have to be careful. You know, what we say, we t we've been talking about that, is so powerful. Do you know that when we say, I'm never going to be like my dad, do you know that, that that's a vow? And it's not a healthy vow. It's not one that we're told to make. I'm never going to be. I mean, we got to be very careful about that. What we should be saying is, Jesus, I want to be more like you. And so that leads me into the second principle right here. The second principle is the WWJD principle. We have the mini-me principle, then the WWJD. What does WWJD stand for? What would Jesus do? So it's, it's the how would Jesus parent our children principle. I always think it's good to look at that, right? How would Jesus do it? If Jesus were you, and he were the parent of your kids, how would he parent them? How would he treat them? How would he discipline them? How would he process <laughs> what they're doing and not doing? How many of you have asked, how would Jesus parent my kids? Have any of you asked that yet? Yeah. Yeah. How would Jesus do it? Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you've done that. Jesus wasn't married. We know that. He didn't have biological children, you know, all those crazy writings that are out there or whatever where they like to make things up and discount the deity of Christ and, and the Word of God. He, he, was, he was a single man. Didn't have any biological children, but he did have children. He had spiritual children. For instance, he had the 12 disciples that he was a spiritual father to, that he was teaching them how to live, how to be a man. A real man, a man of God. And so he was a parent. And, and so there are parenting principles that we can learn from Jesus. For instance, he didn't send his disciples, his spiritual children, off to some, just to some Bible school in the morning to learn everything and say, well, they're going to learn everything from somebody else. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the, the onus on somebody else to ultimately be responsible. So if they mess up, I can always say, well, those people at that school, School, those people at that Sunday school, at that church, they must have messed up, messed my kid up because my kid is acting this way or that way or doesn't know this or that. He didn't do that. He took the responsibility himself. Jesus didn't leave his disciples back at home while he preached to the multitudes either. He brought them along with him, didn't he? And Jesus didn't go out and do his ministry for those three years on this earth alone. He didn't say, hey, guys, I'm going to go do some awesome stuff right now. Y'all just stay back here, get dinner ready, and uh, you know what I like, right? Mashed potatoes and gravy definitely on the side this time. Um, no, I'm still not doing the, the, uh, the, the bacon, still not doing that. There's a day coming when, when y'all can have bacon, but not yet, all right? It's going to happen soon. And so um, anyway, so praise God for the new covenant and bacon. So he brought his disciples along with him. He didn't leave his disciples back. His disciples were with him when he was doing life and doing ministry. They were with him. And so his disciples went with Jesus. They learned hands-on. They were involved in integrated life. 
kind of an integrated life context, a hands-on context of learning. That's how Jesus parented his disciples. It was hands-on. It was integrated. It wasn't, you go over there to that school, and this is where you're going to learn how to become a man of God. And then over here, we're just going to do some other stuff. It, it wasn't separated like that. It was integrated, and he integrated his whole life, whether he was, you know, healing somebody, whether he was tearing up the, the money changers and all that stuff. He was parenting. He was discipling. He was teaching his disciples at all times. He was even teaching them, sometimes you got to get away. Yeah, there may be things that, that you think are so important that you got to minister to right now, but you know what? Right now, you're not in a position to keep ministering. You, even, you have to go away, and you got to have some Sabbath right now. As he went to the other side of the lake, right? He did those things. He was always parenting. He was always teaching. It was a hands-on, integrated life kind of context. He used almost every life experience as a discipleship opportunity. He didn't do this thing that we, we tend to hear in the culture today. Well, I schedule quality time with my kids, and that's where, you know, I schedule that quality time. I mean, I, each one of them, I spend five minutes with every day, each one, and I just listen to them and, and speak into their lives for five minutes. And, and um, you know what, every once in a while, we're, we have a family time and a family day, and it's quality time, though. I mean, we, we make it quality. Jesus didn't do quality time. Jesus did time. Not in prison. Well, he was crucified instead of that. He did time. He spent life. He did life with his disciples, with his spiritual children. Whatever they were doing, if they were walking along the road, it was time. It was quality time. Because really, all time is quality time. Because, again, there are many me's. They're always picking up. They're always watching. There's always learning there's always something that we can be teaching our children. They need to know how to deal with life, how to deal with disappointments, how to deal with being bored, how to deal with got to do the dishes again. It's just the way it works. You know, they got to deal they got to learn how to deal with life. And so all of life is quality time. Every single circumstance and instance in life is a time where you're going to be parenting them. And if you're just not around and you don't include them, you're, you're, you're rubbing off. You're teaching them something. Might not be the right thing, though. Jesus didn't, hey, guys, you get over there. I got some important stuff to do. You get over there. You can't handle this. He didn't do that. He included them, integrated, hands-on context of spiritually parenting the disciples. And we can learn a lot from Jesus as it relates to that. So we want to include our kids in our pursuit of God. That would probably be the biggest thing. Include our kids in the pursuit of God. Involve them. Let them see a life that's going after the things of God. So that means it's not just quality time. That doesn't mean, well, I'm going to show them what it looks like to go after God because I'm going to take them to church on Sunday morning or to grow time on Wednesday night or to go time. You know, we're going to go out and, and feed the homeless and the hungry. You know, I'm going, to show them, I'm going to show them what it looks like to be a man or a woman of God and pursuing God at those quality times. No, every moment of every day we're supposed to be pursuing God. We're supposed to be living lives as unto him all the time. And praying without ceasing. And our kids need to see what that kind of life really looks like. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we don't say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or make a mistake or mess up. But we're doing life as unto the Lord. And they're going to see what it looks like when, when you mess up. When somebody who pursues God, who loves God, like David, who's a, a man after God's own heart, when he messed up, I mean, he publicly, his family, all of the public saw him you know, tear his clothes and, and just repent and, and, and mourn. A man after God's heart. He allowed his children and really everybody else to see how he would process the good, the bad, and the ugly. Our kids need to see what it looks like. We want our kids to love Jesus. We want our kids to, to chase after Jesus, to go to God when they have problems, to not let the world entangle them. Let's show them what that looks like. That's what Jesus did. 
He, he ministered with his disciples, and he, and he showed them what it looked like to go cast out demons, what it looked like to, to raise the dead, what it, looked like, what it looked like to heal the sick. And then he said, okay, y'all go do it. It's interesting he sent them out two by two. Now, we know we can send a 1,000. We can push back a 1,000. We have power in and of ourselves. So even single parents that are in here, I mean, with two, it seems like God likes to use two. There's something with two, but he fulfills the other role when you're left alone. He does. He becomes the father that's not there or the mother that's not there. And frankly, hopefully the church does too, begins to come alongside and and provide that kind of support and, and encouragement too. But it's interesting. He showed them how to minister, what it looked like, and then he sent them out two by two. I got to get cruising here. Okay, so we have that. Um, I did that, by the way, not just as a pastor, but when I was a realtor, I brought my kids along with me. Hey, let's go. We got to put a lockbox on that house. Or, you know what? We just sold that one. We got to get the lockbox off. We got to put a sign up over here. We're going to go do a walkthrough, you know, or I, or I buy a fixer flipper that I'm going to do. And, man, come on, you're going to help me. This is when they were 10, 11 years old, and it's like even younger. Get the shovels and get the, you know what, out of the house, and we're going to put the gloves on, and it stinks, and it's horrible. But come on, let's do it. This is what it looks like to live life. We're going to do it as unto the Lord and not complain too much. And, you know, I mean, and so whatever it is, when I was in technology, as much as I could, I included my kids. Now, some meetings you go to that you probably shouldn't have your kids at. You know, with the AT&T executives and, you know, whatever. But as much as it's possible, I'm just saying, let's include them. They need to see what it looks like to do real life as a follower of Jesus. The third principle, let me hit this quickly, and then we'll, we'll, have, we'll wrap up with a few comments and, and feedback. The Noah principle is the third one. So the first one's the mini-me principle, the what would Jesus do principle, and the Noah principle is the last one. It says this in Genesis 6, verses 9 and 10. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah glorified God. And because Noah was the one person who walked with God, God decided to save him from the flood, right? He called him to build an ark. He called him to accomplish a mission that God had given him, and Noah went out and did it all by himself because God gave him that mission, right? No. No. He didn't. God gave the father, the parent, a mission to build an ark to save mankind and all the animals two by two. And the Lord said to Noah, you know, build an arky, arky. Noah didn't do it by himself. Noah included his sons. He included his children with him in the calling that God had given him. God said, Noah, go do this. Noah said, well, I know how this works. The father includes the son. That's how the whole Godhead works. That's just how it works. So I'm going to include my sons. Come on, boys. God gave, us this, gave me this mission, and you're my sons, and I'm going to include you because you do life with me. You guys, you, we're, we do this stuff together. I'm still alive, and I'm going to be alive for a long time, so come on and let's do this again. Let's do something else. And I know this is crazy, but it's big. We're on a mission from God. I'm not talking about that movie. We're on a mission from God. And it's not just my mission. See, Noah realized it wasn't just his mission that God had given him. It was a family mission. And that's the Noah principle. God has given you a mission. You're not supposed to exclude your children. You're supposed to bring them along, allow them to help build the ark, whatever that ark is, whatever that, that calling is that God has on you. Bring your kids along. That's, that's God's way. That's the biblical way. That's a way that actually saves your children. The children weren't the righteous, blameless ones. The father was. But because Noah included his kids and his kids got on board and followed their father, those who were blameless, who had issues, they and their families, their wives and children were also saved. They got to be on the ark too. And I'm not saying eternal salvation. I just talked about Ezekiel 18, right? I mean, we're ultimately held accountable before the Lord based on our relationship with Jesus. I mean, that's it. But there are things in life that our children will be saved from, rescued from, 
There'll be advantageous things that they will experience. There will be hands up and, 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 and help that they will have because we've included them and brought them along on the mission that God has given us and not said, this is my mission, it's too big for them. Noah could have said that. This ark thing is too big, can't have the boys do it. Now the boys are pretty old by that time, but still, can't have the boys do it. They're just my boys, you know. This is a, this is a, a godly uh, adult size mission. Sometimes we go there, don't we? I want to encourage you not to do that as much as possible. And again, there's some places you can't take kids of certain ages. There just is. There's some places that aren't safe, that just aren't appropriate, that aren't right. God may call us to some of those places. But where we can, I believe we need to be like Noah, and we need to include our kids in the God mission that he has for our lives, for our marriage. They're our children. They're not our children by accident. God knit them together in their mother's womb. They're a reward, and we should include them in the mission, in the calling that God has on us, and when we do, it will be good for them. It'll be good for them. Your faith matters to your families, parents. Talk about this family calling thing really quick, and I'm going to close here. The family calling isn't about adding more stuff, more programs, more busyness in life to your kids. That's not successful parenting. Well, I've got them busy, and I'm carting them around all these places, and they have, boy, they're, they're doing this academically, they're doing this musically, they're doing this athletically, they're doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this, check, 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 check. I'm a great parent. Well, maybe the world says that, but are you including them in the God mission, his mission, the mission that's given you and your family? That's going to have a bigger impact than the music lessons. Just telling you, it's not the music lessons are bad, so they're not wrong. But if we have things in our lives that are preventing us from, from really parenting, the biblical way parenting, then we need to really examine those things. If there's something we have our kids doing that's keeping them from being part of the mission God has given you and your family, then consider which one do you need to let go of? Which one do you need to bring them along in? I went to Ghana, Africa. I was called to go there for a month, and I felt like Noah. I felt like I was supposed to take my family. It wasn't even like God said initially, Eric, you and your family are supposed to go. That took more prayer. I just was feeling like, okay, God, you're calling me to go for a month. I, I think I'm supposed to bring my family. I prayed into it, and I got a release to do that. But I, I just wanted my family to be along to experience whatever God had for us in Ghana, Africa. And that experience, because I brought my kids along, has been life transformational for my kids. In fact, Jake has been with me three times to Ghana, Africa. And I'm telling you what, he's never going to be the same because of the experiences, the things that he got to see and be involved in over in Africa. Because I brought him along. It was my calling. It was God calling me there to minister, but I didn't go alone. He even went, even though he had a peanut allergy, and they don't have, they don't have much for, for preventing that or, or curing that over there. But we trusted the Lord in that, and we were very, very careful. But I brought him along. It's made a big difference in his life and in, in my other kids' lives. So I just want to end with this. It says in Philippians 1.6 that I'm sure of this, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So as we're just kind of doing this intro to parenting and just talking to kind of what the Bible says and some examples biblically about parenting before we're going to dive into kind of how other Christian brothers and sisters have been parenting and, and what they've seen as successes and all this and, and tips and tricks that are rooted in biblical things but how we've actually lived it out in real time, in real life. Um, I want to make sure you're encouraged that the Lord's given you all you need to be a parent he started a good work in you. Your children are a good thing. They're a reward from the Lord. And he'll be faithful to complete that which he has started. This thing of you being the ones entrusted with raising those children. To know Jesus as their Savior. To love him. It'll be a journey. You already know that. It'll have its ups and downs. But life is that way. Parenting's that way, but life is that way. And God's with you. He's gone before you. He loves you. And so be encouraged by that, and um, just think about some of these principles. If you look at them, it's not like 
you know, a 20-step program that you have to follow. And if you miss one thing or get out of order, it's all messed up. It's pretty simple. It's your kids are watching you, so just live for Jesus. Have your kids do life with you. Let them see the good, the bad, and the ugly and how you process success and failure. Include them in your life, not just a little quality time, but, but involve them. That's, I mean, that's pretty, pretty easy, right? It's not. And then the Noah principle. What has God called you to do? Who has he called you to be? Bring your kids along with you in that. It's not just your calling. It's a family calling. 